paper reports that two of the male prostitutes were given a late night tour of the White House last year. Welcome to the Nick Bryan Podcast. Today, I have a big shoe, as Ed Sullivan used to say. In case you're not old enough to remember Ed Sullivan, he looked like he'd been embalmed two days earlier. We used to call him Night of the Living Ed. Today, my guest is Tom O'Neill. He's the author of an amazing, edifying book called Chaos, Charles Manson, the CIA, and the Secret History of the 60s. How you doing today, Tom? Doing pretty well now that we got the computer glitches out of the way. Tom and I uh, are at that age where we're not quite as uh, adaptive to technology as... You I've know. never been. <laughs> you know, one of the... You, you talk to a lot of frightening characters in, when you were researching chaos. And I think one of the more frightening characters you talked to was Vincent Bugliosi. <laughs> Vincent had a problem. He um, thought that the milkman knocked up his wife and he used investigators from the DA's office to follow her. And his girlfriend wouldn't get an abortion, so he beat her up. Why don't you give us a little background on Vince? Well, I think the most interesting thing about both of those two situations was um the first one the milkman episode happened two year two and a half years before he was assigned this massive case tate lapianca murder trial and he shouldn't have even been in the he should have been disbarred because the da had been made aware of the fact that he had um illegally used his own office to pursue this milkman threaten him, stalk him, get information on him. Uh, he did a lot worse, actually, than I put in the book that I found out after the book came out. Uh, the mil I had interviewed the milkman briefly and his wife, and they basically said everything that's in the public record, because they went public about this when Ben spent, ran for office the first time, is pretty much all we have to say about it. We said it then. Uh, and they didn't want to really go into any other detail. Uh, but after the book came out, the daughter of the milkman reached out to me and she said it was much worse, much more intense than came out at the time. And she said, I'll give you one example. I knew that um, her parents had had told the, the school of the two children, her and her brother, who were like, I think she was about five, her brother was about seven, not to let anyone pick them up at school, not to go on the school bus that they'd come and pick them up, her up every day. They found out that was because prior to them writing that note, Vince had gone to the school, picked up the five-year-old, took her to a toy store, let her buy whatever she wanted. Then he brought her home and he put her in the front yard in the walk with a bunch of toys he had bought for her. And the mother came out and he just smiled at her and, and drove away. I, you know, that was another one of his threats. But, um, you know, that was important to me because, number one, it showed how he flaunted his office and how he was also pretty, um, I don't know if you call him a psychopath, obsessed, uh, mentally ill. Uh, but uh, also the fact that I, I didn't understand why he didn't lose his job at the time. And I also understood. My book explores how and why this case was presented in a way that wasn't accurate. And I believe it's theoretically that he was a compromised deputy DA who was brilliant. You got to give him that. And he had to do whatever Evel Younger said. So he was basically a puppet on strings uh, and uh, got the case and, and prosecuted it the way they needed him to. And in the second case, the mistress case happened after the 
case had been tried. He was famous and the book came out. And in that case, his mistress lied to him and told him she had gotten an abortion with the $200 he gave her, you know, with the order to get an abortion. And when he found out that she hadn't, he beat her so badly that she miscarried. And that's in the book because it's relevant, because after that story became public, he lied to the police who investigated and he lied to the papers. I mean, I found out other episodes of his bad behavior in his personal life, but if they didn't involve him lying to police or papers, I didn't include them in the book. You say, I've heard you say that you thought Bugliosi was compromised and that he didn't really, he, he was basically ordered to write the book that he wrote. Well, and to first to try the case that way, and then people who know about his involvement in the Kennedy assassination, uh, you know, the book he wrote that he said debunked once and for all the conspiracy of John Kennedy, uh, that there was more than one gunman. I believe that that was, and again, I, I can't prove it, but I believe that he, he also still had a debt to be paid and had to write that book. So he writes Helter Skelter, and that becomes the definitive story of Manson and the family. Right. For, for And it stood the test of time for many years. And here's Tom O'Neill, who comes along. And then things don't add up. And you talked about Manson com committing a number of crimes. Well, he was on, he, Manson had been on uh, federal parole in LA, and then he went to San Francisco. But you talk about a number of crimes that Manson committed, and nothing happened to him. And actually, they're not even mentioned in, most of them aren't even mentioned in Bugliosi's Helter Skelter. Yeah, yeah. His first year out of prison, after having been in for about six or seven years, he was released to Terminal Island in Los Angeles, immediately violated his parole, showed up in Berkeley, San Francisco, the Bay Area, and went to the parole office there. And they wrote a letter to Los Angeles saying he has, we have no, um, he has no authorization to be here. We're sending him back. We're giving him a certain number of days to go back. He wouldn't go back. And I got this correspondence after a very lengthy, lengthy FOIA battle with the U.S. Bureau of Prisons, who had his parole record. And it was through those records I found out that once he was actually allowed to remain in, uh, I think they call it the Central District. I think the Southern District is Los Angeles to San Diego. Central is San Francisco Bay Area. And then I think Northern is above it or maybe whatever. Once he was allowed to stay in the Bay Area, he just continually committed crimes. And at this time, he was under the supervision of Roger Smith, who was in the very beginning of his supervision of Manson. He was finishing his master's of criminology at the um, Berkeley School of Criminology and also embarking on a drug research project at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic that had just opened. And Manson... I wanna, yeah, I want, I want to explore the Smiths a little bit later because that... That really tells people why Manson got away with all these crimes, at least in, in my opinion. Yeah. it's uh, So you've got Manson, he's busted for drug possession, pimping out underage girls, having guns, including machine guns. And also, I think he's busted for rape twice. And he's a federal fugitive and nothing happens to him. Yeah. I mean, he was released in March and by June up in Mendocino, he had already been arrested for assaulting a police off officer, interfering with a police officer in the line of duty and uh, having uh, contributing to the uh, delinquency of a minor, Ruth M. Morehouse, who was 14 turning 15 in the spring of 67. And all that stuff was reduced to a misdemeanor. He pled guilty, was put on uh, uh, state probation, he was already on federal parole. He was never assigned a probation officer. None of that was ever recorded. Vince never reported it. It was pretty much buried until I found it in his parole file. And then he's busted with Stephanie Shrimp. She's seven years old, 17 years old, and they have a bunch of weed. And you talk about Ed Sanders' book, and Ed said that Manson was released because it wasn't, they weren't joints, they were tobacco. 
but you found a, a sheriff's report saying that that was in fact marijuana. So Manson is busted with an underage girl with marijuana, and again he walks. And and I found the interview with her parents after the group had been identified as suspects in Tate La Bianca, and they interviewed Stephanie Schramm's parents, the two sheriff's detectives, and I think it was the middle of December 69 when they're all in custody. Stephanie's not, she's not charged with anything, but the mother in the transcript just starts yelling at the cops saying, what we don't understand is my daughter who was underage was found with a guy on federal parole and neither of them were holding the pot. The pot was on a table in the in the bedroom they were in that wasn't either of theirs. They had broken into a cabin on a property adjacent to the Spawn Ranch. Why was our daughter charged with possession? And actually it went to court and Manson was released with no charge when he was the adult in the room. That and, happened again and again and again. And the minor was charged with possession. Yeah. yeah. And then when Manson was at Spawn Ranch with the family, he it was the largest raid in California history. Yeah. Prior to the SLA, the SLA uh raid of for Patty Hearst down in LA. It was there were helicopters, all terrain vehicles, police dogs, and scores of law enforcement officers. They arrested about 30 people, including Manson. And Manson, again, a federal parolee, walked away from the arrest. And it, they found stolen cars, credit cards, an arsenal of weapons, and underage run runaways. And again, Man Manson walked. Right, no charges. And that actually happened a week before the pot uh, arrest a week later that we talked about a minute ago. That happened a week after. Everybody knew who he was. One deputy sheriff, Preston Guillory, Guillory went public in late 69 and told the papers and radio interviewers that they had been given a, a all hands off Manson to do not arrest him, keep him out no matter what. And he lost his job because he, he went public with that information. And you're collecting all this information on Manson. You've been at it a while. And one of your big aha moments is you go to the San Fernando Valley and you talk to a former deputy DA who had become a, a criminal court judge and you show him everything that you've got on Charles Manson. And he says, chicken shit, chicken shit, chicken shit. Somebody wanted him outside. Manson was an informant. Well, he said to me, he was, yeah, he said he was more valuable outside than inside to someone. And I said, who? And he said, that's your job to find out. And I go, well, can you hypothetically say, well, could have been the F it could have been the LAPD, the sheriffs, the FBI, the CIA. I have no idea. But he said, normally, I would uh, attribute this to um, incompetence or bureaucracy. He goes, but you show me, because I laid out each case, and there were like 15 of them where he'd been arrested, not charged, or arrested and charged, and then the charges were immediately dropped. He said, there's a pattern here. And this is deliberate. Somebody wanted him outside. He was informing on somebody. And ultimately, according to the cover story, Kerry Melcher, Doris Day's son, plays an integral role in Helter Skelter. He was going to record Manson. Actually, he did record Manson. And um, But according to your book, Doris Day was... Doris Day was Melcher's mother. And according to your book, Doris Day, America's sweetheart, took one look at Manson and said, you're out of your mind if you think I'm going to produce a fucking record for you. <laughs> yeah, yeah. I'm not sure that Melcher ever recorded Manson. I've never been able to determine that. He auditioned him. He listened to him play. And Dennis Wilson recorded him. And a couple other people recorded him. Um, but I've never been able to determine if if Melcher and Manson were in the same studio ever. I think it's likely they were, but I don't know for sure. And Melcher, you met him on a on a rooftop. And uh, at first he threatened to throw you off the roof and then he threatened to sue you. And then he said, let's write a book together. <laughs> yeah, he said that people have been begging him for years to write his memoir. He said, not just about 
producing the beach or the Beatles, um, you know, all the pop of the birds, all the Buffalo Spring, all the bands he produced. But he said, what people really don't know about is my mother. And he said, I could tell you stories about her and the Rat Pack that have never been told before. And he was implying that they were not, you know, favorable stories. And he and the other implication was it was quid pro quo. He basically said, if you don't do this book, we can do a book on me together. And I said, I go, Terry, this is insane. You've just, he threatened to throw my briefcase off the roof with all my notes and also told me he was going to sue me that he had the most powerful lawyers in Los Angeles. And now you're asking me to be your official biographer. It was crazy. You couldn't have run into a nicer guy. You got to love those Hollywood kids. Yeah, yeah. Ne Nepo babies, I guess they call them now. And uh, and their entitlement issues. Yeah. So Melcher was living at Cielo Drive, the house where the tape murders went down. And he ostensibly snubbed Manson. And according to Bugliosi, that Manson went back to the Cielo Drive house and and he was going to exact his revenge against Melcher. But that is not the case because after the murders, I believe that Manson and Melcher met once. I mean, it seemed like Melcher supplicated himself before Manson on his knees. And yeah. And and Manson, Manson also knew, broke into his home. Manson knew that Melcher had moved from the house and he in the words of Susan Atkins, and again, you can't. We, we, there's so little we can trust because everybody was telling different stories. But she said Manson wanted to instill fear in Melcher by killing the occupants of his former home, and then also start the helter skelter race war. But yeah, what I found in Vince's own notes, interview notes, was um, evidence that Melcher had actually continued to visit Manson after the murders that happened. And Paul Watkins, this was not Vince's notes, this was an interview Paul Watkins, who was one of Manson's right-hand men, he gave it to the sheriff's detectives and said that Manson was on, or excuse me, Melcher was at the ranch on acid and fell on his knees begging for forgiveness. And that Manson had said to him, all those piggies had to die. Now, what was frustrating is I found the report, but it was unsigned. So I didn't know what sheriff's deputy took that information from Paul Watkins and Paul Watkins was dead. And I tried interviewing Manson, but I couldn't get any, you know, sensible answers from Manson as was his practice. So I could never figure out, you know, what the context of that was, why, what, what Melcher was, you know, I mean, my imagination goes crazy when I try to wonder what that might have been about. All I know is this is what the detective put in his notes as he was talking to Watkins. And it was very spare, just like three or four lines. And, you know, one of them was Melcher fell on his knees and was begging for forgiveness. On LSD, no less. On LSD, yeah. If I, if I was yeah. on LSD and I came across Charles Manson... I don't know if I'd get on my knees or run. I, right, right, right. So Melcher told all these lies at the Manson trial. He said that he hadn't seen Manson uh, in, in, in quite some time when he had been in contact with Manson. And Bugliosi knew this. He Bugliosi is suborning perjury throughout this entire trial. He, he sure was. He wasn't happy when I put those documents in front of him and tried to get an expl explanation for him. And what's really interesting to me is Bugliosi has been a shining hero for what he did. And it, it really shows that sociopaths can do really well. Yeah. In, in, in law enforcement bureaucracies. Yeah. Well, I mean, even before I found out about his kind of malfeasance just in this case, you know, the very beginning, I was interviewing cops and other attorneys who were involved in the case, and nobody had anything good to say about him. You know, everybody despised him. And some of them said to me that he was literally mentally ill. 
And it wasn't until I started seeing evidence in my own meetings with Bugliosi and his phone calls to me that I'm like, wow, he's really crazy. I mean, it's, some of this stuff I had heard before I knew about the milkman story where he's literally stalking a milkman when he's supposed to be downtown, you know, preparing for cases, following him around, trying to get him to take a blood test because he thought that he was the father of his firstborn son. The murders go down and the police are, are, are looking for the people that committed the murders. But a number of people suspected the family. You talked to John Parks, the Beach Boys tour manager, and he said, after one of the girls told me that they killed the caretaker of Spawn Ranch, then it got real serious for me. Every, yeah. Everyone in their scene suspected Manson right away, even though yeah. it took the LAPD four months to bring him to justice or arrest him. Well, I'm not so sure the LAP didn't know. That's one thing I've been trying to figure out since day one, whether uh, I, I, if I had to bet, I think they knew, but it was still hands off. They were using him for something. And that, that's where you have to speculate, you know, whatever that was, wasn't finished. And now intelligence starts to rear, or the CIA starts to rear it, its ugly head. Um, you came across Reeve Whitson. Yeah. Who was integral to helping the AP LAPD solve the killings. But he also had this shadowy background of uh, the CIA or intelligence. Yeah. And again, all I could get from the CIA, the everybody I foiled about him was, we can neither confirm nor deny. Since my book came out, other people have gone off after tax records. He never reported any income tax his entire adult life. But he lived, you know, he was based in L.A. He traveled internationally a lot. Who paid him? What did he do? You know, he would tell different people different things. But, you know, that's you have to be so careful because people boast. You know, everybody wants to say they're working for the CIA. But he was definitely involved, like you said, integrally in the LAPD investigation. And that's documented in the, the book that, Sharon Tate's father, who, who was military intelligence, wrote with Bob Helder, who was the head of the LAPD Tate murder investigation. They identified Reeve, they gave him an alias because he always had aliases and it was Walter Kern. And I got both Paul Tate and Frenchy Lajeunesse, an FBI um, agent who was also kind of peripherally involved in all this to confirm to me that uh, Walter Kern was Reeve Whitson. I might be bastardizing this name, but uh, Reeve Whitson befriended Shiroke Hatami. Is that how his name is pronounced? Yeah, Hatami um, was an Iranian photographer. He was actually Sharon's personal photographer. He had shot her for Life magazine. He made a documentary, a short film about the making of Rosemary's Baby. He was on the set of that and uh, got very close to her. And um, he was pretty much bullied by Whitson into identifying Manson as someone he said he saw on the property in March looking for Terry Melcher. And he told me that uh, he was never certain what happened or who he saw, but he was told if he didn't say it was Manson, he'd be deported back to Iran. And that was when the Shah was running the show and he had uh, his secret police, which weren't very friendly for- I didn't even think of that. Yeah, that was when the Shah was still- in office and power, yeah. His secret police weren't, weren't really friendly towards dissidents. Our but, CIA had trained them how to deal yeah. with dissidents. Yeah, yeah. What's fascinating is Bugliosi, I think, is suborning his perjury too. Yeah, yeah, a few people's. Yeah, I mean, Greg Jacobson, uh, Danny DeCarlo, all, all of the prosecution witnesses, you can't trust anything that they said on the stand. Um, I mean, people, Linda Kasapian's own attorney told me that he was sure Vince wrote her entire testimony. It was like a script. Linda Kasabian was a Manson family woman who was the getaway car driver. But well, the first night of the murders and then drove them there the second night, who was a new member of the family. And she turned state evidence to get full immunity. Um, and he basically told her to do whatever Bugliosi said if she didn't want to go to prison or, or to the electric chair. Um, 
Yeah. It's, this, it's... this is a very interesting passage from your book. Reeve apparently had become friends with a Tommy. Yeah, yeah. And Reeve, in your in your book, you say Reeve called Hatami ninety minutes before the maid found the bodies. Uh, well, Sharon, Sharon Tate. That's what Hatami swore by. Again, you know, I, I wasn't able to corroborate that uh, with a second source, um, but that's what he said. Reeve told his. Um, closest friends before he died that his lifelong regret was um he could have prevented sharon from getting killed that uh he had infiltrated the manson family in some capacity for law enforcement and that he had been to that tate house the night of the murders after the murders had been committed but before the police arrived um his first cousin told me and it's in the book that um, she was visiting Reeve and his father a number of years after the murders. And the father told her that when he woke up August 9th in the morning, and I think by about 10 in the morning, it, it was hitting the radio airwaves. Then the very first editions, late morning editions of the papers came out that these murders had happened. And they hadn't identified the fifth victim who was shot in his car, who turned out to be Steve Parent. And um, I can't remember what the cousin's name was, but she said that Reeve was sitting next to his father, and the father said that Reeve wasn't, he had lived with his father at that point, that he wasn't in his bedroom that morning, and he clearly hadn't been home that night, and the father was worried that he was the victim in the car, so he called up the LAPD. They sent police to his house and set up a command center to wait for Reeve to come home. They knew he wasn't the body in the car, but they wanted to talk to him. And she said to me, I said, what did Reeves say when the father told that story? She said, he didn't say a word. He just listened. So do you think that Reeve had foreknowledge of these murders? That's the, that's the problem with the whole book. I mean, I have that from three or four people who were very close to him. Some of them are prominent Los Angeles citizens. One of them ran MGM Studios. Uh, all I have it on is their word, which is secondhand hearsay, because they heard it from him. Manson did say in a book that he cooperated with when he was in prison in the late 70s, 80s, that he had gone back to the house to, quote, see what my children had done, and that he rearranged the scene to make it look a certain way he wanted it to look, and that someone had gone with him, and he never identified who the person was who was with him when he rearranged the scene. And there's a guessing game in the Manson blog world, you know, among the people who speculate that it was Nancy Pittman or Bruce Davis, you know, people who hadn't done the original killing. So um, I present a hypothetical case that if Reeve did go back after the murders and before the police and Manson was there then and the bodies were rearranged, maybe he was part of that. I wrote a book called The Franklin Scandal, and it's about very bad things that go down in Nebraska. But it's tied to Washington, D.C. And you can't understand the bad things that go down in Nebraska without understanding the prime movers of those bad things in Washington, D.C. In your book, Chaos, given Manson's, Manson could basically essentially do whatever he wanted without getting arrested or without going back to, to prison. He, he had multiple arrests and was, yeah. I mean, he could have been violated at any time. And I don't think people can understand Manson's essential immunity in Southern California without understanding his time in San Francisco. Yeah. And you well, that's it. one of the first things I was curious about when I read Helter Skelter, David Smith, who ran the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, um, where Manson brought the girls first for, you know, treatment for STDs and pregnancy stuff was the free clinic in the Haight. And then he went there for parole meetings with Roger, his parole officer, once he opened his office there for his research project. I think, I think Vince does donate dedicates like three paragraphs in this massive book 
to Manson's time in San Francisco when he morphed into, you know, he, he left prison, this kind of illiterate con who nobody took seriously, into this guru who had complete control over these young followers who would do anything he said. And, and that, I thought that was the most important year of Manson's two years of freedom, and Vince didn't write anything about it. So that's what happened was I started exploring that year to see how Manson became the boogeyman, you know, the, the mo, mo, I can't remember what Vince calls him in this book. There's a lot of hyperbole, like, uh, uh, I don't know, I, I can't remember, but probably a portrait of evil or something like that. How did that happen? What was Manson doing then? And that kind of opened me into the whole world of the intelligence, the drug research, the M MK Ultra Project, Intel Pro, and all those good things that our government has uh, perpetrated against Americans. Yeah. yeah. So David Smith ran the Haight Ashbury Free Medical Clinic, and Roger Smith was Manson's parole officer. They are not related. Roger Smith, this is very strange. Manson was his was the only parolee that he was supervising. He had by the end, yeah. Originally, another weird thing that I found out that Vince didn't put in his book. Right when Manson was released, they had started something called the San Francisco Project, which was a project to study recidivism rates in parole people who were paroled to the district. In other words, what makes some people commit crimes again, violate their parole and go back. And all the parole officers that were in it were given different numbers of parolees to supervise. Roger had the smallest number. I think it was like 30. The ones with the largest numbers were 200 or so. But Roger was kind of leaving the parole business at that point to take over this amphetamine research project. And by the about December, January, December 67, January 68, Manson was his last parolee, and he, he was the only one he was seeing. And it was part of a, also a federally funded uh, government project to look exactly at, you know, with a microscope, their behavior once they're released. Are they committing crimes? What are we doing when they're committing crimes? And it was like Roger Smith did the opposite of that. He looked the other way. Well, he even helped Manson out. When uh, Manson sent, I think, three or four of his women followers to Mendocino to recruit yeah. some youths, and they gave some LSD to a deputy sheriff's uh, kid, 15-year-old yeah. kid, and uh, he didn't have a very good experience. So they were all arrested, but Roger Smith came to the rescue and said, these are very pious, wonderful people. Please let them out of jail. Yeah, he, he wrote um, reports to the, uh, you know, they assigned somebody to do a, a probation investigation and then present it to the judge and either recommend, they'd already, all of it had eventually pled guilty to lesser charges con contributing to the delinquency of the minor drug possession. And the judge has to decide whether to send them to jail, prison, or give them probation. And they interview the people who are, who volunteer or who they get to, you know, tell them what they know about that person and whether they think they can be uh, released into the population or should they be punished. And Roger wrote for two of the three women uh, that he knew them twice as long as he knew them and that they were nice women who just believed in free love and they were harmless. He knew that you know they were criminals who acted under Manson, his parolees, direction to commit crimes. He actually wasn't his um, parole supervisor at that point, but he had become the foster parent of Manson's firstborn son with a Manson girl with Mary Bruner. He didn't disclose that to the person doing the investigation. He, he, all he said was he was a former parole officer. He didn't say I'm the parole officer of the guy who's their Gambino, you know, the kingpin. Uh, and uh, two of the three women, all three women were given probation not jail sentences, even though the probation officer's conclusion was they needed to go to prison to be rehabilitated because they were still dangerous. And he was right, because two of those three women, Mary Bruner and Susan Atkins, ended up killing for Manson a year later, less than a year later.
I was fascinated when I came across that passage in your book where Roger Smith, Manson's former parole officer, becomes a foster parent to Manson's child. Yeah, that wasn't my discovery. I mean, Ed Sanders reported it first in, um, in, the, in the family, his book. I was able to um, add a lot of information to it because I was able to get records up at Mendocino. I was able to interview Roger about it and Roger's wife about it. Um, Mary Bruner would never talk to me. S since my book came out, I've become friendly with Michael Bruner, the baby who we're talking about, who, who was fostered by Roger. And I actually put him in touch with Robert, Roger a few years ago before Roger died. And they had, I think, a couple phone conversations or something. How was meeting his son or talking to his Manson's son? I didn't really, you know, I, Michael didn't want to be put on the spot, I think. I think Roger told him stuff in confidence and I didn't want to press, pressure him. I just think that Michael, oh, I know Roger told Michael not to believe a lot of what he read in my book. That's about all I know. And, and he said Roger was very nice to him. And, you know, Michael's trying to find out what he what his childhood was like because his mother doesn't like to talk about those years with him and then roger goes on to for to uh i guess he was like the lead investigator for the amphetamine research project which is kind of interesting i mean it it, it would be kind of a, a mk alter type of a thing it's uh they noticed that people become violently psychotic on amphetamines and they wanted to see if this violence could be controlled. Now, that's definitely something that would go down for MK Ultra. And, you know, prior to that, he was studying, you know, group behavior. You know, he was studying gangs in Oakland, youth gangs, and why some kids were more prone to becoming violent and, and leaving everything behind you know, school, their families to join join these um, violent youth gangs. And that kind of evolved into, you know, and what affected drugs, in this case, particularly amphetamines, have on their behavior. Um, part of his studies were about collective behavior, you know, and, and how were some kids more vulnerable to being, you know, wanting to follow the leader, to become part of a group where other kids, the individuals who didn't want to, you know, take orders from the gang leader and left, went on their own. Why? What were the personality traits? Which, yeah, is a lot like what the MK Ultra project was looking into. And, and you know, and COINTELPRO and Chaos were also inter infiltrating groups of, at that time, mostly Black Panthers and Black activist groups, but criminal gangs, you know, and left wing groups and anti war groups. They didn't like those left wingers no. <laughs> out on the West Coast. No, no. And David Smith ran the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic where Manson spent a lot of time. Manson and his followers spent a lot of time there. And it was underwritten by the National Institute of Mental Health, which had parceled out a lot of CIA funding. Yeah. Do you, did you find a connection between the CIA funding and uh, David Smith's Hate Ashbury Free Medical Clinic? Well, without going into too much detail, I actually had my first visit with David since the book came out. Actually, the first time I've talked to him, probably in almost 20 years, I was in San Francisco about three weeks ago, and he reluctantly, but eventually said he would meet with me. So I went to his house and spent a couple hours talking to him, and he's very upset with me, very upset with the book. He said it wasn't fair. Uh, he said that it ruined his legacy, which was he's kind of iconic in San Francisco and in, you know, public health, because he did create the first successful free free clinic in the United States. Um, there were a couple smaller ones before his that he modeled after, but they didn't last more than a year or so. His lasted until my book came out and it closed for some reason a few months after. But um I promised him that in the follow-up book I'm working on, I'm going to make it very clear that if any of that stuff was going on, he claimed not to have any idea of it going on. Um, and he thought that in my book, I made it seem like he was um, kind of the architect and the engineer of all that. And I said, I'm sorry, I really didn't say that in the book. I present a 
what I found, what I could document. And I never said I proved that you were at all complicit in this stuff. But, you know, there was a lot of stuff going on there. And you told me you knew everything happening there. And I mean, he studied the group. He wrote a academic paper on them before they were identified as the killers. They actually had it ready to be published. And the same week it was going to the printing press, he told me they were identified as murderers. So they held it and waited about six months before they published, published it. It was a study of their communal life at the Spawn Ranch. One of his administrators went down there as what he called a sympathetic cousin and lived with them, Alan Rose. And then he came back, wrote this paper with David, and he was living with Roger Smith when he wrote it in 1969. It's kind of like the CIA was using the hippie movement as like a Petri dish. Yeah, yeah. Just And now we come into contact with CIA psychiatrist Jolly West. You couldn't find a nicer guy than Jolly West. Yeah. And actually, he's got a an office or a room at the Haight-Ashbury Free Medical Clinic. So he's tied in to David Smith on, on certainly on some levels. Yeah, David told me, you know, when I interviewed him in 99 and 2000, that he gave Jolly West an office to recruit subjects for his research studies. He said, I didn't know he had anything to do with the CIA. I just knew he was interested in the effect of LSD on youth. That's all I knew. And I said, well, why would, knowing so little, did you give him you know, a prized office at your clinic. And he says, because I knew he attracted government funding. And then in another, you know, in the same breath, he says, we didn't take government funding. And I said, but you did. It, you know, I, I had this conversation with him three weeks ago because he kept saying, one of the things I'm angriest about is you said all our money for the clinic came from the government. And it didn't. He said it came from rock and roll. Bill Graham threw free concerts for, or, or through what do you call it, uh, concerts where the benefits all supported the clinic. And I said, yeah, you did that too. But the papers you were publishing in your self-published journal, the Journal of Psychedelic Drugs, in the end notes all say they were funded by grants from the NIMH, the National Institute of Mental Health, which was used as a cover for MK Ultra. That's government funding, David. So that's an interesting part of our conversation. He also said to me, you wrote in the book that I gave Jolly that office when Manson was there. He goes, I didn't give him that office until the early 70s. Manson was, and I said, no, David, Jolly was only in the hate from 1966 till the middle of 66 till the fall of 67. You told me in our very first interview on tape that you gave him this office the week the clinic opened, June of 67. And I have it in journals of the people who were doing his research for him that it was affiliated with your clinic. So you can't change that story now. Stephen Piddle, you use a quote of his in your book. Uh, he was a forensic psychologist and he described Jolly West as the only benevolent psychopath I have ever met. <laughs> yeah, that was a great quote. Yeah. And I know someone who's in the CIA who kind of gives me the willies. And I was talking to him about Jolly West, and he said, nicest guy you'd ever want to meet. And um, I just, uh, he and I kind of became estranged uh, through that mm -hmm. and some other things. So you got Jolly West, and he's opened up basically an apartment where hippies doing drugs can be studied. <laughs> He, he described it as a laboratory disguised as a hippie crash pad. And uh, the hippies were the white rats. Yeah. And the thing about Jolly West is the MK Ultra experiments, some of them were just unbelievably vicious and brutal. Yeah. And I believe that Jolly West was involved in some of those MK Ultra experiments, even though the CIA told you that. It had no relationship whatsoever with with Jolly West. Well, actually, they they gave me a neither confirm nor deny. But I had a woman who was a fact checker at the Post, Washington Post, who at one point was working with me in one of the iterations of my book when it was being published at another publisher. And I paid her for about 
I don't know, half a year or so. And I loved her. She was great. But she said, I've got an inside pipeline. I can get around. You don't have to do FOIAs. And the person came back and said to her, Wes had nothing to do with this agency. There's no record. And and we no, your, your writer is wrong. And I told her, I said, well, I hope you haven't been relying on this same person for Washington Post information because she's wrong and I have all the documents to prove it. So maybe she was lied to by her superiors and they do compartmentalize there. But Wes, I mean, Wes went to his grave threatening to sue anyone who said he had been part of the CIA's M or the, the MK Ultra or the agency in general. He graciously denied it till his last breath. And then he mistakenly left all these documents, correspondence between him and Sidney Gottlieb, who ran MK Ultra for the CIA, he mistakenly left that in his papers at UCLA, and I found them. So that kind of rewrote his, the history he'd been telling. For, I mean, people had speculated until my book came out for years that he'd been part of it just because of circumstantial stuff, but nobody could ever, you know, have a document showing it. And I found, you know, these letters. The first one was in 1953, I think it was 12 or 13 pages. And I showed it to John Marks, the one who wrote the real first book about MK Ultra, The Search for the Manchurian Candidate in 1978. And he said it was like a blueprint for MK Ultra. He said it's the most it's the only unredacted MK Ultra document I've ever seen in my life. And he told me that in the early 2000s. With West, he uh despised the 60s idealism. And you kind of, ref I would say, kind of infer that um, that Manson could have been, and and I'd heard this other place before. I, I read your book that, that Manson was the the string that was pulled to stop the '60s, and you use a Joan Didion quote with it. What do you think about that theory? Oh, I think enough of it to put it in the book, but I also had to say it's a theory. I haven't proven it. Um, it looks like it's, in, in my opinion, it's more likely that is the case than that it's not the case. I don't think they wanted him or his followers to kill a eight and a half month pregnant woman, but I do think that they were pushing him and provoking him and experimenting on him and his group to see what they could do. And there was a history of that in the MK Ultra program, you know, trying to, they were, the ultimate goal was to create programmed assassins. And Manson became exactly, he became capable in under a year in 67 in, in the Bay Area of, of doing what the CIA had been trying to do since about 1952-53 and spent the most money they'd ever spent on any program. At least that's what they said when it was disclosed in the 70s, their most expensive, the most classified pro project up to that point. And they claimed when all of this stuff came out and it was very limited because they destroyed the records um, that they were completely unsuccessful. They kind of let themselves look like a laughing stock. I think the headlines in the papers were when there were congressional hearings, the, the the doctors are the gang that couldn't shoot straight, you know, like everything was um, like a Three Stooges exercise, but I believe that it was the opposite of that, and that was, you know, what their limited hangout was, to make it look like that so they could continue using that technology. Well, you've got Wes Papers where he talks about implanting thoughts into people. Well, in 1955, he wrote to them. This is two years after he started accepting funding to do experiments, first at the Lackland Air Force Base, where he was the head of the psychiatric um, department in the hospital. And he wrote in that first letter that he was going to you know, do drug experiments on basic airmen, on psychiatric patients, on prisoners without their knowledge, using LSD, hypnotherapy, and other drugs. Um, and then in 55, he reported that he had developed the technology to insert false or, or replace true memories with false memories without a subject's knowledge, which is, you know, the whole, they wanted to create programmed assassins and they wanted to be able to manip manipulate people's memories so they could get them to do stuff and then forget that they had been programmed to do it.
During the church hearings, MK Ultra came out because of uh, former CIA director William Colby and Sidney Gottlieb, the Prince of Darkness, who ran MK Ultra, who was corresponding with the Jolly West, and John Gittinger, who was a psychologist. When they testified before the church hearings, they said that it all came to naught, like you just said. Yeah, yeah, and and, and Gottlieb testif testified behind, behind closed doors. No journalists were allowed to witness it. Um, he wasn't even photographed going in or out of there. They, I think there might be one picture of him, but uh, and Gittinger testified in open, you know, to Congress. I interviewed Gittinger. Um, I don't even know if I quoted him in the book because he did what they all do. Oh, you know, we probably shouldn't have done it, but it wasn't nearly as bad as people said, and we didn't really learn anything from it. And it was, you know, we shouldn't have done it. It, it wasn't a good idea. And Jolly West had a meeting with Jack Ruby before Ruby was going to testify before the Warren Commission. And, and Ruby wasn't quite right after that. Yeah. And the cover story with Ruby is that he, this gangster, who is a pretty major gangster that owns strip joints, this gangster felt so bad for Jackie Kennedy that she might be called to testify that he killed Oswald. One of his lawyers even admitted um, before Ruby died that he had given him that line. Say that, you know, first Ruby said he, he didn't know why he did it. He said he had, they said he had epile an epileptic fit. Um, and then um, I think within 24 hours, I forget which of the lawyers it was, one of his Texas good old boy lawyers said, just say you wanted to spare Jackie Kennedy from having to come to Dallas for a murder trial. And that was a story that was put out there. And I think it lasted until about the time he died. And people probably still quote it to this day, that that's why he did it, because he loved Jackie so much. That's fascinating to me. The, the media has tried to show how one of those bullets could have the, the magic bullet, I think it was, that had uh, seven different entry and exit um, wounds or produced seven uh wounds and uh between kennedy and also john Connolly, and then but yet it was in a pristine condition as cyril yeah. weck said that bullet will do anything you want it to <laughs> so you've got you our mainstream media has explained oswald shooting john kennedy and this magic bullet that has seven entry and exit wounds and but yet it's completely pristine and it's like I've, I've heard commentators say well we put it to bed but then jack ruby shows up and then how do you explain that and then that's how it's explained that he wanted to save jackie from going to texas and testifying but Jack Ruby wasn't quite the same after he met with Jolly West in prison. Yeah, well, West, um, you know, he got assigned to the case. <clears throat> Ruby was convicted. He never testified in his first murder trial. And he fired his lawyer, Melvin Belli, whose defense was that he, he had suffered from epilepsy and he didn't plan to shoot Oswald. He didn't even mean it. And he had no recollection of it which I'm not so sure isn't the truth that he had no recollection, but I, I don't have any proof of that. But then after he was convicted and given a death sentence, uh, he hired a new lawyer who was an old you know, colleague of, of Jolly West, Hubert Winston Smith, who immediately put West on the case and assigned, asked West to examine Ruby. And Ruby was alone with him in his jail cell and then came out and spoke to a press conference and said in the preceding 48 hours, Ruby had had a psychotic break from which he would never recover. He said, the man that I was with today had auditory and visual hallucinations. He saw people in the room that weren't in the room. He hid under the table. He told him that he could hear Jewish children being boiled, boiled alive outside his cell at night. Now what the Warren Commission didn't know or maybe knew because Alan Dulles was on it uh, and Richard Helms was Jolly West's boss at MK Ultra was that West, um, yeah, 
uh, sorry, that um, West had, and part of his plan with Gottlieb was to induce mental breakdowns in, or insanity in, in a laboratory setting um, that would be permanent and fixed. Um, and, uh, you know, had the Warren commissioners who were real investigators known about that, that, that West was for all intents compromised because he was working for the CIA who was one of the um, suspects in the murder, you know, I mean, the CIA agency, they, have to, they had to look at law enforcement and they were looking at Oswald's possible ties and those records we still haven't received. They, he should have been, it should have been disclosed about the relationship West had with the CIA. Well, actually the CIA came out with a quote unquote dispatch in 1967. I don't know if you're familiar with this, but a lot of people just didn't buy the Warren Commission report. and the CIA came out with this dispatch that said, what we're going to do, and, and this was given to editors and anybody with juice, what we're going to do is anybody that questions the Warren Commission, we're going to call them conspiracy theorists. And these are the negative attributes yeah. of conspiracy theorists. And the New York Times and Washington Post use the term conspiracy theorist maybe once a year but after that it just escalated are, are you familiar with that dispatch i think i am now well i know that once mark lane started publishing his books and going public that they you know they organized smear campaigns and then they had the mockingbird project where they would uh, plant cia agents and major media uh you know, you know all forms of media magazines newspapers television and try to control the information that came out and uh yeah basically discredit people who question it and you even got to talk to charlie charlie manson charlie was it once no it was two or three times but only on the phone because he wasn't allowed to have visitors at the time and unfortunately i never got to sit down not that i would have gotten more i, I thought i'd have a much better chance of getting better information if I wasn't on the phone with him. And when I was on the phone with him, he kept getting angry and upset and handing the phone off to his guy inside jail, who was his kind of bodyguard. And then that guy would yell at me and then maybe Charlie come back. Maybe he wouldn't, but it was pretty excruciating exercise of just, you know, one game after another game with him. I got a kick out of uh, Charlie's bodyguard. His name was Pincushion because he'd been stabbed so many times. Yeah. His name is also Roger Smith, too, which is weird. His name was Roger Dale Smith, but that's just a coincidence. But yeah, he, he was called Pincushion by the other inmates because he'd been stabbed so many times. Yeah. You put 20 years into chaos. I wrote a book called The Franklin Scandal, and I dedicated seven years of my life to it. And um, in your book, I believe you say, if I wanted my book or even just my book, my proposal for the book to be more complete than my premiere piece would have been, I had to let the story consume me. And, that, and then you talk about it almost like it's an, akin to, an, to a calling. Do you still feel that way? Well, it's the only way I could have ever finished it. If if I let it take over, because you really had to put every last ounce of energy. I, I don't know what your seven years were like, but my 20 years were it was all consuming. You know, I had no family. I mean, no immediate family, no, not, nothing else I had to support. And that's not a healthy way to live. And I don't advocate it. But I think if I had had any of those other responsibilities, I never could have done it. It, it had to be so narrowly focused and intense. I had the same thing with the Franklin scandal and I had a, a very nice one bedroom apartment in the village that I lost. You were lucky. You got a major publisher to, to go with your book. For me, the Franklin scandal, I could not get a major publisher to touch it. And I, it was ultimately published by a, a small publisher on the West coast. And I would do it again, for sure. I believed in what I was doing, but when you, talked about you being consumed by it and a calling i i felt that way about the franklin scandal 
I, I've heard. I also have to correct you. I had a major publisher, one of the best, Penguin no, no, Press. No, that's what I was saying. Um, you had a major. No, publisher. no, I had them, but then they pulled the plug. They canceled the deal, and then they sued me for the return of the advance, which stalled the book for two years because I couldn't try to resell it until that lawsuit was settled. I kept reporting, but my agent couldn't take it out and basically said to me, with the with Penguin Press, you know, one of the most elite publishers in the business suing me, he said, I don't know if we'll ever be able to resell this book because it's got a black mark against it now. So I, I was lucky or whatever that Little Brown, which is a major publisher, did publish it. And I can't even remember if it's in the book, but the irony is after my own publisher, Penguin Press, basically derailed me for two or three years, my agent had to send them um, the, the uh, proposal when we were finally taking it out after the lawsuit was resolved. And they liked it so much, they offered to buy it again. And I said, that's insane. I go, <laughs> it, it just makes you question everybody's motives, you know? And I thought, what are they gonna do? Are they gonna string me along again and then cancel it right before publication and sue me? Maybe they, you, you do start to get paranoid. I hear that. You dived into this reality, and I think that you learned a lot more than you ever thought you were going to learn. That That's what happened right. to me in the Franklin scandal. You yeah. learned about Donald DeFries being a CIA project, and uh, Sirhan Sirhan probably mind-controlled. I've, I've heard you say those things in, uh, in various interviews. And when I was diving into the Franklin scandal, I had to go all the way back to the JFK assassination if I wanted to study it. And how has that odyssey affected you? I don't know. I mean, in the end, I'm glad it's behind me, although now I'm working on a follow-up, but uh, it impacts you. It makes you a lot more, there's kind of a little bit of, as naive as it sounds, but a loss of innocence. I became much more skeptical, cynical, less, you know, believe, easy to believe authority. I'd always been, you know, I thought, you know, healthy, like a healthy skeptic, but nothing like, you know, I, I had no idea the depths of deception that go on in, you know, places that we're supposed to trust, agencies and bureaus and things. My, some of my friends, when I was pursuing the Franklin scandal, which, which is about a interstate child trafficking network that's tied to intelligence, very, very much like the Epstein network. But my friends, some of them thought I'd lost my mind. Oh yeah, same here. Yeah, I, I had I, when you when I read that or heard it, I really thought that I, I really identified with you because um, I had a very nice writing career going, and people thought. I completely lost my mind by pursuing the the Franklin scandal. Tom, you've been a really good guest. I want to thank you for coming on the Nick Bryant podcast. Thanks for having me, Nick. It was fun. The fates finally let Tom and I get together. We were uh, we've been trying to get together for quite some time, but we've surmounted yeah. the fates, and here we are. Even yesterday, we were supposed to do this this time yesterday, and my sister ran into a hole in the street and got thrown from her bike, and I had to accompany her in an ambulance to the hospital. So I thought it was never going to happen, and then the computer didn't work today, but thank God we did it. But we did it, and uh, thank you so much for the interview, and thank you so much for putting 20 years of your life into shining a light on something that's very, very dark. Sure. Sure thing. You're welcome. <laughs> Take care, Tom. Have a good night. Okay. Thanks.